Hello and welcome to this After Effects Certification Preparation series of videos. I'm Luisa Winters. In this video, I'd like to discuss Objective 4.5a, which is to use basic autocorrection methods and tools. In this movie, we're going to talk about stabilization and color correction. And, you know, for the test, this clearly says basic autocorrection basic autocorrection. So I'm going to take you a little bit beyond, but for the test, you only need to know the auto parts of it. So what it does automatically. All right, so let's go into After Effects. In After Effects, please go ahead and open the project that was included with your exercise files. If you have not downloaded the exercise files, that's okay. Just start a new project, start a composition and add a clip that needs stabilization and another clip that needs color correction. That's it. So you can follow along, no problem. But for those of you who actually have the exercise files, do this with me. Go ahead and open the composition names, stabilization and color correction. And in here, you're going to see two clips. The top one is invisible because I clicked on the eyeball. And then the bottom one is going to be for color correction. So let's start with the stabilization one. Go ahead and click on the eyeball and select that layer. And you're going to see that it's just a layer of a uh, tethered old flag. Uh, this is a drone shot that I took a long time ago. So it does need stabilization, but hardly any. So if you just scrub through this, you're going to see that the flag is moving quite a bit. But what I really want to stabilize is the horizon there. See the top of the trees? That's hardly moving, but that's okay. We can fix it. To add the stabilization, all you have to do is right-click the layer, go to Track and Stabilize, and then Warp Stabilizer VFX. And then it starts working immediately, starts analyzing it. You're, you're going to see this blue banner that is just saying analyzing background, blah, blah, blah. And you're going to see here in the Effect Controls panel that there is an effect called Warp Stabilizer, and it's just going right away. So the warp stabilizer is going to work by tracking, tracking this whole clip. And then it's going to apply the stabilization. So what this means is that once it's done tracking, it doesn't need to track it again. It only needs to track it once. And then you can make changes to the stabilization and all it needs to do is stabilize. And you see it here with this orange banner. And that's it. So basically, this is the automation. This is it. You're done. If I play this, it's already much stable. And in fact, as you can see it better if I just scrub it. See, it's the flag is moving, but the background not so much. And, and this is what happens, right? If you want to see the before and after, there is this FX icon to the left of the words warp stabilizer here in the effect controls panel. If you click there, you're going to see that the clip slightly zooms out. So it becomes a little bit smaller. So the warp stabilizer made the clip a little bit bigger. And the reason for that is because of this. I'm going to use a post-it for this. I get it. It's not very elegant, but I think it'll name, uh, it'll, it'll uh, put my, my point across. And it's this. If we're stabilizing position, this is what it is, up and down, left and right, you know, we're just stabilizing that. If we are stabilizing rotation, we're adding this to it. If we're stabilizing perspective, we're adding this to it, right? And this. And there is one more, which is the warp, that it would basically warp the image kind of like this, all right? So it's not too difficult to understand. And I'm going to go through the settings a little bit more. But then again, remember, this goes beyond what's going to go on the test. For the test, automation, boom, we're done. I know, right? Right click, choose Warp Stabilizer, VFX, done. 
All right, so now we're gonna go a little bit more. So why does the clip become smaller, right? And it does, it's because it needs to crop it. If you're moving things around, and I'm just gonna do it like yay, see it? Imagine that's what it is, it's stable. The only way to do that is by applying these position keyframes to counteract that, but then you're gonna see the clip moving all around the frame and you're gonna see empty spaces like that. If I make that bottom invisible and I make this transparency, I mean, that's alpha transparency. The only way, and this is an exaggeration, okay? This is an, exager an exaggeration. So the only way to not see that is by making the clip bigger. That way, you know, even if it moves all that it wants, you're not gonna see a gap, all right? So I'm just gonna undo that because yeah, we don't, we don't want that. Now, going back to the stabilization, here we go. If you go in order from top to bottom, you're gonna see that the result can be smooth no, uh, motion or no motion. If you choose no motion, then you're gonna see the orange banner again, stabilizing it. But remember, it doesn't need to track it again because it already did that. Right, and there it is. And now you're gonna see much less motion. I mean, that that horizon is hardly moving. And if you click on this FX icon to, you know, to temporarily disable the effect, you're gonna see that it's actually zooming in a little bit more. It's because it, it, it gave a, a much stronger stabilization. Now, I, I kind of like the smooth motion, so I'm gonna leave it at that. And then you have the amount of smoothness. You can do it, you know, 50% is the default and actually <laughs> it works, it works. But if you want for the smoothness of the motion, maybe it's still a little too jerky to be more, increase that value and that's it. Honestly, I think I've had to do that like once, maybe twice. So not very often. So I'm gonna undo it to go back to 50. And here we go. Now we go to the method. Position, we already saw that. Position, scale, and rotation. Perspective, we saw that. And the subspace warp, which is this guy, right? And I know, it's like, imagine the post it is the video. It's just very hard to show with the video. Uh, the default is subspace warp, so I'm gonna leave it at that. You could preserve the scale or not. All right, so I usually don't preserve the scale because the, the shakiness is only a little bit, but if it's a lot, then I'm going, because it's gonna zoom too much, right? I will preserve the scale and I'm gonna change this one. Do you see the next uh, uh, drop down menu? You could choose to only stabilize, right? If you choose that, I'm gonna make the bottom invisible. You are going to see, see that little gap there? You can hardly see it but it is there. Let me zoom in like yay. See, it's only a couple of pixels, but it is there. See it? Actually, that is like one pixel. So, you know, I'm saying, all I'm saying is that you could choose not to scale, only to stabilize, to stabilize and crop, to stabilize, crop, and auto scale. There you go. Gone the gap because it did an auto scale, right? And you can also choose to synthesize edges. This is way past advanced what the text is gonna cover, but it's worth to mention it. When the clip is moving and it's leaving those gaps, which is why it scales, right? You can actually grab those pixels from earlier frame or later frames. And that is what synthesize edges means. It's grabbing those pixels from other frames I'm putting them here. And the setting for that is here under advanced. See where it says synthesis input range and it's 0.5 seconds. It's looking uh, half a second in the future, half a second in the past, just to see if it can find those pixels. And you can change this value. In fact, I'm gonna make this a little bit wider so that you can see it better. And instead of 0.5 seconds, it could be one second, right? So it's just gonna look for those. And remember I told it to preserve scale, I'm not going to. And now instead of just scaling, it's actually synthesizing those edges. In other words, grabbing those pixels from previous or latter frames. And you can also have a 
feather, and you should have a feather, kind of like a gradient in between the pixels that it got from the other frames and this one. So a little bit of a feather edge will help. Now, you can choose uh, cropping, you know, an edge cropping or not, right? So that's for synthesized edges. You know what? I am not going to even choose that. I'm just going to do an auto scale. And uh, you, you see how everything becomes now grayed out? It's because it's not applicable anymore because I'm not choosing the synthesize the edges, right? The moment I am stabilizing and synthesizing the edges is like, oh, okay, there it is. I'm just saying, right? Now, going on, we can look at the objective. So the objective right now is to stabilize. But sometimes we want to have something reversible, reversed, or we, can, we want to apply that motion to something else. Maybe we have a shot that we got from a tripod. And now we want to imitate like we have something handheld, right? We would actually stabilize a handheld, a completely different clip, right? And then we would apply that motion to a different layer and that's what we're talking about here so then now that layer would get that motion that would look natural because it was taken from something that was done natural it was really done handheld it's not just something that we go oh let me keyframe position it'll look the same yeah you know what it never does so it's better if you just grab it from something that was actually taken handheld all right going on you can show the tracking points. Do you see all the tracking points here? You can make the tracking points bigger. There it is. I mean, you can't miss that. Those are not going to publish, but we're just showing them now. And you can also hide the banner. I recommend doing this. I absolutely recommend doing this, and I'll tell you why. I'm going to hide the tracking points, and uh, in fact, I'm going to... Um, actually, I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to go to auto scale. So the defaults, I'm going back to the default. Do you see that banner? I have been ju a judge in a competition in which I saw some clips with that banner. Yeah. What that means is that they rendered it out without checking, and then it was left with a banner. Trust me when I say this, you're better off with a shaky clip than you are sending a client or a competition, OMG, a competition with a banner in there. So almost always by default, I just say, hmm, okay, I'm hiding that banner. So no matter what, that's not gonna show on my video. It's embarrassing, okay, it's embarrassing. Alrighty, let's now move to color correction, to color correction. In the timeline, let's make the top layer invisible and the bottom layer visible. So we are going to color correct this. And to color correct this, there are a number of tools here in After Effects. So we can go to Effect, Color Correction, and we can go to Auto Color. Boom, done, right? So we can actually do a little bit of smoothing because, it's, so this is what this means, right? The smoothing, when you do Auto Color with anything, this works with Premiere too, the camera moves and, you know, changes luminance or chrominance or white balance or whatever it is, there is a distinct change in the color of the clip. And what this does is that it actually offers you a smooth transition between the one setting for the auto color correction and the next one so that it gradually goes from one setting to the other. The next thing is this. This already has a lumetri color effect added to it. This is what we're going to be working with, this Lumetri color. But before we do that, let me just take you through other ones. Auto contrast, auto levels. All of these are auto, and all of these are going to have a temporal smoothing. All right? So if you need to do something automatically, that would be a great way to do it. Now, the effect that is added here is Lumetri Color, and we are going to use it. I'm just going to show you where it is. Effect, Color Correction, Lumetri Color. But I also want you to know that we have, under Window, Lumetri Scopes. 
This goes way beyond what the test is going to give you. But quite frankly, I would feel guilty if I don't mention this. Lumetri scopes, you have to see the scopes because you can't trust your eyes. When you're color correcting, you cannot trust your eyes. You don't know if you're mixing color temperature, so you have an open window and then you have a candescent or fluorescent light, whatever it is. I'm wearing a, a pink shirt, whatever. That is making my eyes biased to certain colors, right? Uh, the colors that my walls are painted, all of those things. All right, so when it comes to color correction, you can't quite trust your eyes and you can't quite trust the monitor that you're working with unless you just calibrated it. But quite frankly, folks, come on, be honest. When was the last time you calibrated your monitor? I mean, I have a right X, you know, and I do calibration, but I don't do it every day. And I teach with computers that I don't know if they've ever been uh, uh, a color calibrated. So I can't trust the monitor either. So I can't trust my eyes and I can't trust the monitor. What can I trust? The scopes. The scopes, that's what you can trust. So the scopes work like this, right? By default, you're gonna see this one, which is a waveform monitor. All right, I'm gonna show you what I always show on my scopes. And just so that you know, this is going way beyond. And, and in fact, let me just cut for a little bit and let me give you the automatic here. So basic color correction, white balance, click on this eyedropper, click on something that should be white here. I'm gonna say like, yay. And the color correction happens automatically. Is that simple? Oh, no, 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 I needed even more auto than that. That was just white balance. Okay, reset it. See this button that says auto? Boom, done, done, auto. But quite frankly, I mean, no, let's do this properly. I'm going to reset that effect so that it goes back to what we were, uh, what we, uh, uh, how we were before. And I still want to talk about the scopes. The scope display, go ahead and right click in here, go to preset and go to this one, which is called vector scope YUV, parade RGB and waveform YC. This is what you want to see. You want to see a YC, uh, uh, a waveform monitor down here. You want to see a vector scope here and you want to see the RGB parade here. Because of real estate, I mean, I'm recording the screen. So, you know, in, in reality, I work with a big screen. So I have all the real estate in the world. But in here, I'm a little bit more constrained and I am recording 1920 by 1080. So I need more room. I need more room. So here we go. I am going to not have the vector scope. That's a right click and not have the RGB parade. That's another right click. All righty. This is showing me luminance information. This is the waveform monitor, right? This is showing me luminance information. And if you look at the picture from left to right, and you look at the scope from left to right, this is showing us the darker pixels at the bottom and the brighter pixels at the top. So you see this, that, that goes like a, like a little curve there. That is the gradient of the sky. See how it's darker here than what it is here? So this is showing us the dark pixels in the bottom and the bright pixels at the top, and of course, all the midtones. So we are going to adjust these pixels using these guys. It, you might be tempted to adjust the color first. Don't do that. Adjust the luminance first. Luma, brightness and contrast first, always first. And it's not because if you do it any other way, it's going to be wrong and oh, look. it's because it's going to take you longer. It's going to take you much longer because you're going to have to go back and forth and back and forth. Well, this is a one and then you're done. All right. So do it in this order. Luminance first and then the blacks. You're going to adjust the dark pixels first. And I want you to notice that there are numbers here on the left. They go from zero to 100. What we want is for these brightness information of these pixels to go as close as possible to zero without all the pixels being crushed at zero. So if I make this, say, darker, do you see how the pixels start crushing here at the bottom? 
that's known as crushing the blacks, crushing the blacks. We don't want to do that. So I'm going to undo, control Z. There's a little bit of crushing happening in here. So I am going to, not the exposure, but the blacks, I'm going to bring them up a tiny little bit, not too much. In fact, I'm going to press and hold the control key as I drag up. And that lets me drag slow, slower, right? So you see it's 0.7. Now I'm going to go to the whites, in other words, the top, and I'm going to raise them a tiny little bit. The idea is for them to go close to 100, but not really touch it. All right? So that's the idea. Right now, if I turn this effect on and off, you're going to see that the clip is slightly more contrasty. All right, slightly more contrasting. So adjust things in this order. Black first, then whites, then mid-tones, then mid-tones. And the mid-tones are going to be a combination of shadows and highlights. So you can bring these up a little bit. You see how the whites are staying where they are and the blacks are staying where they are? It's because they're not being really affected, right? So I can bring these up a little bit. I can bring the shadows up a little bit, right? And I'm just scrubbing the values and see how the blacks stay where they need to be. So why would you want to adjust the midtones? It's, it's really to change the time of day, right? So this as a, is at an earlier time of day. Listen, we shot it at the time in which we shot it, right? I'm talking about the perception of color, the perception of color. This is at an earlier time in the day than this. This is later in the day. This is afternoon. The other one was morning. So you can change the perceived time of the day of your clip to match whatever it is that you need it to match. So I'm kind of digging that. I'm going to leave it like that. And now that I'm done with my luminance, with my brightness and contrast and midtones, I am good with Luma, it's time to go to color. And for that, I'm going to start with a vector scope. And remember, I'm really using a preset. In reality, in real life, I'm using this and I'm looking at all of them at the same time, all right? So one thing that I forgot is this. You should really scrub the whole clip with the color correction applied just to make sure that there is nothing in there that kind of sort of escaped you. It needs to look good in two places. It needs to look good here on the scope level and here in the monitor level, all right? It can't just look good on one and then you go, oh, but it looks good on that here. And, and, and here is like completely off. It needs to look good on both. And of course, obviously, it needs to look good to you. Yes, even if you don't trust the monitor, even if you don't trust your eyes, it needs to look good to you. So, you know, make sure that it looks good in all of those places. All right, so now I'm going to go to the vector scope and I'm going to make the other two invisible. And here we go. The vector scope, it, it has like this blob in the middle. I know I'm so technical, right? Blob. This blob is formed by these dots. These dots are called traces. Each and every dot represents a pixel in the image. And you see that they kind of sort of change as the video plays. Not that much, but they change a little bit. And this is showing us color. Color is showing us where in the color spectrum each and every pixel goes. Like if a pixel were pure red, it would be here. Do you see this little rectangle thingy, well, square thingy uh, with an R and it is red? right? So red, magenta, these are called the targets. If a pixel were purely red, only red channel present, then it would be right there, boom, in the middle of that. The same for magenta, blue, cyan, green, and yellow. The more away from the center it is, the more saturation these pixels have. So I can go to the saturation and see how it becomes more or less saturated, less, right? And then that's, of course, grayscale or a lot, very little, a lot. Now, I'm going to leave it at a lot only because I want to show you this. Do you see this perimeter here that connects the targets? 
Well, your traces should not go outside of that perimeter because things can happen that are unsightly. And that has to do with the technology and the technology that we're working with and all of that. There is a reason why those lines are there. Always make sure that your pixels stay within the lines, inside of the lines. And this is not a case of, oh, you know what? Know the rules and then break the rules. Yeah, no, mm -mm, no. Leave it as it is. Even if you can say, but Luisa, come on, I'm not going for broadcast. I don't have to follow these legal colors. They are antiquated, blah, blah, blah. You know what? They still count. Even if you're going for YouTube, even if you're going for whatever, it doesn't matter. Make sure that you follow it. And remember, it needs to look good here and here. So this, to me, to my eyes, too saturated, way too much. That's better. All right. But listen, one thing is certain. If you color correct something and I color correct something, I am willing to bet any amount of money that they will not agree because we see colors different, right? And we have different tastes. What you like, what I like different. So, hey, you do you, you do what you like, do it your way. You don't have to do it my way, do it your way. All righty. So this is telling me that I have a lot of orange pixels. So that is that, you see that haze there on top of Manhattan? It's kind of orangey. And of course, a lot of between blue and cyan, which is of course the sky. And then the rest doesn't have too much color, maybe a little bit of yellowish, but you know, we can count that within that orange because this again is measuring color and not luma. Color, but not luma. Speaking of which, let me just lower the exposure a little bit. Do you see? And if I raise the exposure, do you see how raising the exposure actually changes the colors? I mean, how could it not, right? It's making them brighter. So I am going to reset that back to zero, and this is what we had. So there is a relationship between how much exposure you have and how much saturation you have, all right? So there is a relationship, don't forget that. All righty, again, for the test, all you need to know is this is auto, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going a little bit beyond. I'm going to right click and I'm gonna to go to the Parade RGB and then I'm going to disappear the vector scope. And this is actually all three of my channels separate and they are intensity. So do you see how red doesn't look like it's two other brothers? Red is a little off. And you know what? I'm not saying that's wrong. I don't know. What if you're shooting the ocean and everything is blue and then you go, oh, well, blue is off from the other two. Well, duh. You know, what if you're shooting, I don't know, grass and then everything is green? Of course, you're going to have more green than anything else. But generally speaking, we want a little bit of balance in between these. And again, don't forget to just go all the way here, right? So I should have done that with the vector scope. Let me go ahead and do that. And we are legal and we're legal. We're good. Don't forget to scrub it like that. I know, I forgot. And here we go. So if I wanted to balance this, and it could be that I'm perfectly happy with this, that I just go, well, I don't need to change anything. I like it the way it is, then leave it. But if I wanted to balance this a little bit, I would talk to Red. I would say, hey, Red, you, you need to come down a little bit, see? I mean, here at the bottom is pretty good, but at the top, not so much. You could come down a little bit, okay. Nothing better than curves to do that. Curves, go to the red curve and talk to the curve. And this is how the curves work. Do you see here, bottom left? That is the bottom. See, only the bottom. Just forget what it's doing to the, to the video right now because yeah, it's changing it. See, it's, oh, it's an ocean of redness, right? Top right is the top. See it? And do you see how everything turns like cyan? Yeah, that's because cyan is the complementary or opposite color of the red channel. So if I wanted to just move this like yay, that's it. But this is a line, so things are kind of sort of connected. And now this lower, this lowered part a little bit too much and this part here. 
So I can actually add another dot here and then just push it up like that. See it? Look at the before and the after. The change is very minimal, but it is there. All right. So I'm going to leave it at that because, you know, we could do an entire course just on color correction. And by the way, all of this is applicable to Adobe Premiere because the Lumetri tools are nearly identical. There's a couple of differences here, like the buttons are in a different place and nearly identical, either in Premiere or in After Effects. And even the, the, the scopes are the, the same. So remember a couple of things. It needs to look good to you. It needs to look good to the scope. The colors have to remain within the, and I'm going to use the word, but legal realm. In other words, nothing below zero, nothing above 100, and in the vector scope, nothing outside of the perimeter. Nothing. All right. Again, not one of those things that you can go, yeah, but in this one case, just don't do it. Just don't do it until our technology changes. And then finally, this is color correction. In addition to color correction, and I'm not going to cover this, but in addition to color correction, we can do color grading. So I can have this be much warmer. And I'm going to collapse Lumetri only because I can add another Lumetri. So effect, color, correction, Lumetri color. So now I have two Lumetri colors, and I can just go, hey, you know what? I'm not correcting anymore, I'm grading. So I want this to be, oh, that was the tint. I meant to go to the temperature, more yellow. Maybe I want, uh, you know, the illusion of a very yellowish sunset, whatever, all right? So one thing is color correction, one thing is color grading. Color correction corrects things you know, defects of the camera, uh, whatever it is. And color grading gives your clips the look that you want. All right, don't forget, for the test, for the test, this is now uh, this a summary, right? Stabilization, track and stabilize, warp stabilizer VFX. Let it do its thing, done. That's it. Let it do its thing, done. For the test, add Lumetri, click on Auto, done. If they're talking about white balance, click on the little eyedropper, right? Click on the little eyedropper, click on something. Give me just one second. Let me move this. Oh, it's not updating. There you go. Now it's updating. So click on the eyedropper, click on something that should be white. Listen, I know it's not white, but I'm going to click on it anyway, just so that you see the change. Boom. And the changes will be done automatically. So you either click on the auto button or you click on the white eyedropper for white balancing and then click on something white or even better, go to effect, color correction, and use one of these auto things, automatic because that's what the objective is all about. All right, this brings me to the end of this movie. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next movie.